So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are doing well. I'm back again with another video. And apologies for being far or being away for quite some time. For those who know me well, uh, you know, apart from being a YouTuber, being a, uh, an active participant in the taxi business, there, are, there is another job that I do on full-time basis, which take almost all my time. And, you know, I don't have sometimes a lot of flexibility to do as many videos as I may want. But when I get a, a moment, I will never hesitate to give you information that will help build your resilience, that will make you a better driver so that you can make opportunities out of the difficult taxi industry. So if you watched my last video, you will notice that um, between date 8 of this month and date 13th of this month, I had traveled to Ghana. So and in particular, I was in Accra. So Accra is the capital city of, of Ghana. I had gone there for other business reasons. But, of course, I cannot go to a city or a country and not really try to investigate what is happening with their ride-hailing uh, business, their taxi business. That is Uber Bolt and the rest. And um, I got a lot of insights. I had very, very in-depth uh, discussions with the drivers. Unfortunately, I did not have time to, to record videos, but I listened to every taxi driver who carried me. I asked them questions. And that is why I came here to do this video, so that we can try and compare what is happening in the taxi business, let's say, globally. I don't want to say completely globally because I, I'm just comparing scenarios in two countries. But I can tell you that um, given that drivers in Kenya are um, you know, operating on Bolt, drivers in Ghana are operating in Bolt, same as Uber for both countries, the scenarios are not as different. But there are particular details that I want us to analyze together. And, you know, today being a very important day in Kenya for taxi drivers, because they have put down their tools, they have switched off their um, applications, drivers have left their cars at home in protest. You know, they are complaining about a number of things. One being the commissions that these taxi companies are taking. And secondly, the price of trips. You know, they are saying that prices are very low and they cannot be sustained. You know, they cannot sustain their businesses. So, you know, apart from being in, in Ghana and being in Nairobi, I've also been into, into South Africa. And I have also done similar investigations to understand whether drivers in these three countries are complaining. And the reality is, all of them are complaining. Drivers in South Africa, Ghana, and Kenya. Taxi drivers are complaining everywhere. Some time back, when I was, you know, doing the part-time driving, I carried a taxi driver from, from London. So he is a Kenyan who had relocated to, to the UK. After some years, he got permanent, um, you know, permanent, uh, how do we call, call it? Permanent nationality to, to the UK, and he became a taxi driver. And when we were chatting, when I was driving him some like three, four months ago, he told me that even in the UK, drivers go on the street every other time to protest the low prices. So from those four scenarios, we can agree that drivers are complaining everywhere. Do they have a genuine case to complain and to take their, their battles to the streets? I agree, there is an issue. Okay? But... Why is it that Uber and Bolt have turned a deaf ear into all these complaints from almost all the countries where these applications operate? They tell you, you know, that simply means that, you know, there is a case behind why Uber, Bolt and the rest are not reacting, you know, as drivers might want. Is there room for improvement? I would say yes. But again, what is the nature of this business of taxi? What I observed in Ghana, and this mostly I want us to, you know, to discuss the case between Ghana and, um, and Kenya, because those are my two re most recent experiences. In Ghana, I just want to give you a few figures that I was able to gather there. For instance, I noticed that, um, you know, the minimum price, you know, for the shortest trip is around 125 Kenya shillings. 
So in Ghana, if you take a trip of 2-3 kilometers, less than 4, you will pay 120 Kenya shillings. In Kenya, the minimum trip, inclusive of discount, a driver should get it at around 200 Kenya shillings. That is, you know, inclusive of discount in, and, and inclusive of commission. So the petrol price in Ghana is retailing at around 130 shillings. Well, in Kenya, we are now almost at 180. So there is a 50 shillings difference. Okay? I also had a discussion with a driver who owns a Honda Fit, and he told me that a Honda Fit model of around 2016-2017, ex-Japan, in Ghana you can get it at around 750 Kenya shillings. In Kenya, a similar car, you will get it at around um, 1.2, 1.3 million Kenya shillings. That simply tells you that uh, in Kenya, collectively, the cost of life, the cost of life, sorry, the cost of life is a bit higher than what you will find in Ghana. So for everything that you purchase in Kenya is a little bit more expensive than what you purchase in Ghana. And that informs why the price of the shortest trip in Ghana is a bit, you know, cheaper than what you get here in Kenya. So let us now discuss the reasons why drivers are taking their fights to the street. Drivers have said that fares are very low. I agree, there is huge room for improvement. But the moment I realized that drivers don't matter in the whole equation of cab business, I stopped complaining. You know, you know I have my applications. I'm a registered full-time, uh, no, part-time taxi driver. I have some cars that I have given to, to, to drivers. And I have, you know, continuously advised my drivers to not develop a negative attitude against this business. Because from where I stand, I don't think that this business will ever change. It is made to operate that way. It is made for drivers to be an ecosystem, not for drivers to be partners. Drivers in this equation, they don't matter as much. Money is not created when drivers get paid and they pay a commission or they pay tax to the government. No. Money that circulates within the taxi business is very, very small amount of money. Money is made by the people who are carried by taxi drivers to their destinations, to their workplaces, to and from. People who are delivered to their destination by these taxi drivers are the ones that run the economy. They are the ones that matter the most because where they go is where the business is being done. Where you drop them is where contracts and deals are being signed. And the, the interest of government, the interest of government in these um, ride applications is for you to carry as many people as possible so that deals continue to be signed, so that people continue to have meetings, so that people continue to do transactions in huge amounts. Not in the amounts that, you know, the rider pays to you in 200 shillings, 150 shillings. That's very, very little money for the government to take any tax from it, even for these companies. You get my point? So they will never, ever try to improve or make your earnings more by making the life of the riders hard. They understand that the more riders circulate, the more people are traveling up and down, more money will be made. And that's why the race to the bottom will not stop. This applications these applications these taxi companies have been made for that reason you get my point and why don't you ask yourself why is it that even the government they have not acted against these applications in as much as these applications are charging very low fares you get my point to a point that drivers have to overwork it to a point whereby drivers have to work extra hours to make something, but the government does not do anything. You know, with a strike or a stroke of a regulation, everything in terms of pricing can be overturned by the government. The government can say, 
For instance, we have moved uh, the commission from 20 to 5 percent. As long as these companies can prove that, you know, they are making a slight margin. The government can change everything about pricing. But they are not willing because the moment prices go high, less people will circulate and less businesses will be done. So drivers have to come into that reality that this business is made to be difficult for them, for other people to find it easy to move around. And the moment you realize that, I think you will stop complaining as much. That's why government will not help you. The only person who can come to your rescue is, I don't know, because Uber and Bolt, they cannot try to modify their prices here in Kenya. Because the moment they modify their prices, Ghana will call for, the, for a similar modification, South Africa will call for a similar modification, Morocco and the rest. The only justification that can make Uber and Bolt change their price without explanation is simply by a regulation. Anything else they touch there, there has to be a market or an economic explanation. Either prices have gone high, either the, the price of you know, acquiring a car has gone high, other factors you know, have gone up and then they adjust the price. But these price adjust, adjustments have always been there. You know, when fuel came down from, 100 to, from 220 shillings to right now where it is at 180, a lot of drivers and a lot of passengers did not realize. But fares came down. But how does Bolt and Uber adjust prices? In, they adjust by 2-3 shillings per kilometer. So a lot of people will not notice that because they round it to the next 10. Okay? So, for instance, if you are paying um, 230 for a, uh, a 5-kilometer distance, if you do 6 kilometers, then you will, you will be charged maybe 240. Very minimal. But what I see that Drivers want to see, they want to see drastic changes in terms of price increase. And that's what, that's what happens. The way I have explained the, you know, the decrease in price when prices of fuel went down, it's the same way that prices are increased when fuel prices go up. They increase by two, three shillings per kilometer. And then a lot of people travel a distance, an average distance of seven kilometers. So you'll find that at the end of that kilometer, the increase in price will be maybe 10 shillings. You get my point? In as much as drivers will complain, but it will not be, be very visible. I think drivers are looking forward to a situation whereby prices will double or triple, but that will never happen. These apps, they use a, a fixed formula that they input the factors, and then when there is adjustment, they try to adjust that and reflect in the final price, but the change is always very, very minimal. It's not, unless you are very keen, you might not notice the fluctuations of prices. The only time that people notice fluctuation of prices is when there is surge in demand. You get my point. So, what is the solution moving forward? My advice to drivers is that when Bolt and Uber and these other companies set the price, let's say, for instance, you are carrying someone a trip of three kilometers, they are being charged 200 shillings. When they charge like that, Uber and Bolt, they don't care whether that car is yours, whether you have bought it on loan, whether it's, it belongs to a partner, that is not their business. They consider that there is only one stakeholder in that car, and they assume that that car is being driven by the owner. Whether that is true or not, it reflects some reality on the ground. Because there are so many drivers who are driving their own cars. And they will tell you that in as much as that money is not enough, it is not very bad when you are driving your own car that is not on the loan. So that is the ultimate situation that Uber and Bolt operate on. So them actually that's why they say when they market their applications, they ask, do you have a car that you would want to do business with? You get my point. They don't tell you, go buy a car and do business with. They tell you, do you have a car already to come and join our platform? You get my point. Because the reality is, if you are driving sub somebody's car, your income will definitely be less than someone, someone who is driving his own car. 
But how does Uber and Bolt adjust to reflect those two scenarios? If you are driving your own car that is fully owned, you don't have a loan, and someone, el someone else is driving a car that has a bank loan or a mortgage or, or a logbook financing, how does Uber and Bolt adjust to reflect that? It is not their business. Their business is if you have a car, you go to them. You get my point. If that money is shared among other people, it's not their business. So those are the realities that drivers need to understand. And that's why I tell drivers, anytime you join the, this platform, make it your objective to own a car as soon as possible. Even if it will mean sacrificing you know, all your luxuries, sacrificing everything that you can do without, do it and have your own car without a loan as soon as possible. Only at that point, you will try, you will start enjoying this business a little bit. Otherwise, um, just like any other job, taxi business is not easy. It is not easy, but I find that it presents an opportunity for anyone to earn a living. You, you get, as long as you put some efforts, you will make something small. But for the drivers who are striking, you have a valid and a genuine reason. But you are missing the point. Nobody has their interest in you. Nobody has their interest in drivers. Because that's, that is not where business is being done. I have said business is being done through the people you carry. And the more that is made easy, the more the government benefits, the more the industry and the economy benefits. So I don't think there is anybody who has your interest at heart, even if they keep telling you they have your interest, they are saying, if you cannot do this business the way it is, drop your tools and other drivers will come and take your position. Unfortunately, that is the, reason, that is the position. And for me, I don't support this Uber and Bolt, you know, in the way they price, but in a way I, I understand where they are coming from. Because they are saying we need to, in, to increase affordability of movement within the city. And you know, that is the value proposition they bring to the government. They are telling government, we will help people walk around, move around your country so that they can do business and create more tax for you. So if you are a driver there and you feel like you cannot do business within those parameters, <clears throat> my advice is that you look for something else. Because these guys will not, even in the US, taxi drivers are always on the street. Even in the UK, they are always on the streets. You get my point. This is, and I have done a video before I have said, this is a business that can only give you as much. There is a limit that you cannot go beyond. And I, I have explained this to like people who work in supermarkets as cashiers. Jobs of cashiers in supermarket, for instance, in Kenya, they are known. You will be paid between a certain amount. Whether you are a senior manager or you are just the first day trainee, their money is known. They are paid between certain range. If you want to earn 100,000, 200,000 from being a cashier in a supermarket, you will never get that money in that role. You better plan your move the next day. The same thing with taxi. These guys, they have said, on average, a driver in Nairobi will earn between 200 and 300 shillings. That is average, 200 and 300 shillings. So, you, if you earn ten, uh, uh, you know, 500 shillings within an hour, well and good. But their plan is that you make 200 to 300 shillings per hour after deducting commission and after deducting um, fuel cost. The cost of maintaining your car, it is not their business. And why is it difficult for them to integrate those parameters in their business? Because people are using different type of cars. People are using different quality of, of, um, of, of spare parts. They are using different quality of, you know, of car accessories. If you go and buy tires, if you go and buy whatever you buy for your car, it does not last you the same time that it will last someone else. Because you are buying from different suppliers, you are buying from different qualities, your driving behaviors are different, and also your car type is different. 
So there is no way that, you know, all these parameters can be put together. But I know they have maybe a standard estimation of all those. You get my point. So what I'm saying is that at the end of the day, let it be known that me, I don't see this business getting better. It is made for investors. If you are a, a partner, it is made for you to make 10,000 per, no, a, a maximum of 10,000 per week. And from that 10,000, you'll take care of all servicing and repairs and spares of your car. And for drivers, if you are doing somebody, if you are a driver to somebody cars, somebody's else car, then your money is also limited. If you want more money than that, my brother, my sister, there are other opportunities that one can pursue, but I don't see them in the taxi industry. So I hope I have had um, a rather difficult conversation with you, but a genuine one, an honest one. And uh, I wish drivers all the best. I support you. I know if we get the prices to be increased, then more money in our pocket, which is a good thing. But I don't see it happening. In any case, all the best, guys.